Let's review the anatomy of the larynx. The larynx is a muscular tube in the neck that contains the vocal cords. It's the uppermost opening to the tracheobronchial tree and lies anterior to the esophagus. The larynx functions as a sophisticated valve that lets us breathe air, cough effectively, and swallow food and liquid without aspirating. Vibration of the vocal cords vocalizes sounds. The laryngeal skeleton gives the larynx rigidity and support. It's principally formed by the hyoid bone and the thyroid and cricoid cartilages. Attached anteriorly to the inside of the thyroid cartilage is the epiglottis, a curved leaf-shaped structure. Its upper rounded edge projects into the pharynx just behind the tongue. The stalk at the base of the epiglottis allows it to swing up and down over the laryngeal outlet, opening and closing it like a trap door. The depression between the epiglottis and the tongue is called the vollecula. The vocal cords are ligaments that project forward from the arytenoid cartilages to the inside of the thyroid cartilage. The opening to the trachea, called the glottis, lies between them. All the cartilages, ligaments, and muscles are covered by mucosa. Because of the structure of the larynx at any given glottic opening, there is more resistance to inspiration than to expiration. For this reason, conditions causing airway obstruction, such as edema or tumor, usually produce symptoms with inspiration before expiration is even impaired. Protection from aspiration also depends on muscle coordination. During swallowing, the whole larynx rises in the neck, the epiglottis folds over the glottis, and the tongue and pharyngeal muscles direct food and liquid backward into the esophagus. When muscle tone is lost, the epiglottis, tongue, and other pharyngeal tissues fall backward, blocking the larynx and obstructing breathing. A good example of this from everyday experience is snoring. The differences in pediatric airway anatomy are most marked in infants less than one year of age. Sometime between the ages of six and eight years, the laryngeal anatomy, although smaller, resembles the adult. Many aspects of the young child's airway anatomy predispose to airway obstruction. The infant's larynx lies higher in the neck, opposite cervical vertebrae 2-3, instead of opposite the adult 5-6. In all adult, non-human mammals, and in the human infant, the larynx can be elevated so that the epiglottis slides up behind the soft palate to effectively lock the larynx into the nasopharynx. With the soft palate fitted snugly around the larynx, a constricted passage is formed on both sides of the elevated larynx, allowing liquid to pass around the larynx into the esophagus. The tongue is larger relative to the mandible and fills the mouth, angled slightly forward to cover the gum line. These features allow the nursing human newborn to suckle effectively and breathe while swallowing liquid. The ability to breathe and swallow at the same time is called obligate nose breathing. All mammals other than the adult human are obligate nose breathers. However, this anatomical configuration places the child at greater risk of airway obstruction and makes airway management more challenging. A newborn infant breathes through his nose and can suffocate if the nose is obstructed. The only time newborns breathe through their mouths is when crying. A congenital defect, known as coanal atresia, occurs when the nasal passage is narrowed or blocked by tissue. Newborns with bilateral coanal atresia may need resuscitation at delivery. The baby's relatively large tongue more easily obstructs the airway. The higher position of the larynx in the neck makes the larynx appear more anterior during intubation, since it's harder to displace the surrounding soft tissue forward and out of the line of sight. When supine, the large occiput flexes the head forward, 
collapsing the tongue and soft tissues over the larynx and blocking the airway. The cartilage composing the trachea is soft and easily compressed. Extreme extension or flexion of the child's neck can obstruct the airway. In fact, pressing on the soft tissue under the chin to get a good mask fit can also obstruct the airway. The larynx is not only smaller than the adults, it's also anatomically different. The epiglottis is shorter and more omega-shaped, making it harder to pick up with the laryngoscope blade. It's softer and more easily deformed. In the adult larynx, the gap through the vocal cords is the smallest diameter. However, in a young child, the smallest diameter is the cricoid cartilage, which is below the vocal cords. This means that you can occasionally pass an endotracheal tube through the vocal cords, but then not through the cricoid ring into the trachea. Never force a tube to pass. Instead, switch to a smaller tube. The cricoid's narrow, rigid, ring-shaped bottleneck also increases the risk of airway obstruction when swelling occurs. Minimal swelling can cause tracheal obstruction because the larynx and the trachea are so small. One millimeter of circumferential swelling in an adult with a 10 millimeter trachea causes only a 20% obstruction. The same one millimeter circumferential edema in an infant with a three millimeter trachea causes a 70% obstruction. Thus, swelling from infections or trauma can have a much more devastating effect. Between two and six years of age, the larynx gradually descends to a lower position in the neck. At the same time, the posterior part of the tongue descends, gradually forming more and more of the anterior wall of the oropharynx. By six to eight years of age, the upper respiratory system has assumed the adult configuration and the epiglottis can no longer reach the soft palate, even with maximum elevation. The posterior third of the tongue is now vertically oriented to form the anterior wall of the oropharynx. The nasal passages of older children are often filled with adenoidal tissue. Hypertrophied adenoids and tonsils can fill the dead space in the back of the pharynx, making assisted ventilation more difficult. It's currently estimated that 1 to 3 percent of children suffer from obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA, a condition more often thought of as an adult disorder. OSA is now the most common reason tonsils and adenoids are removed in children. Pediatric sleep apnea typically appears between the ages of 2 to 6, but it can occur from infancy to adolescence. It's believed to affect girls and boys equally, and it's often undiagnosed. Untreated obstructive sleep apnea in children has been linked to behavior problems, impaired growth, learning disabilities, poor school performance, bedwetting, high blood pressure, and heart disease. Understandably, airway management can be more challenging when such a child loses consciousness or develops airway obstruction from other causes.